Okay, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Grant for such a kind introduction. And uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here uh, this morning. And no, 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 okay, let's adjust me. I'm going to move this a little bit higher. Otherwise, I'll use the hand mic. How about now? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, as I was saying, it's a great honor to be here. And thank you uh, for Dr. Grant for uh, his kind introduction. And it's uh, um, also a special pleasure to have all my uh, favorite mentors here uh, in the room and uh, uh, this weekend. Uh, so uh, just to start off with some basic concepts on um, what is the Chiari malformation. There's a lot of uh, uh, different terminology that you see in the literature and on the internet. So um, just wanted to go over some uh, basic anatomy and some basic uh, concepts. Um, so first, um, who, was, um, who was Chiari? Who was, uh, uh, we hear sometimes uh, a term uh, Arnold Chiari um, used. And uh, initially I thought um, the, the um, person who coined the Chiari malformation was named Arnold Chiari but it's actually two different guys. So <laughs> uh, Hans Chiari was an Austrian uh, anatomist and a pathologist uh, who uh, performed autopsies on babies and noticed uh, this anomaly of um, uh, the, the very back part of the brain called the cerebellum um, herniating into the foramen magnum, which is the large opening into um, into the, the, the uh, back of the uh, brain. Uh, so he described this uh, cerebral tonsillar herniation um, in 1891. Uh, three years later, Julius Arnold, who was also a pathologist, he was German, um, described the same finding independently. And uh, Julius's students uh, actually coined this term uh, Arnold Chiari, and they put his name first. Um, even though he wasn't the first, uh, first guy to describe this. So just to, to get to real basics, what are cerebellar tonsils? So cerebellum is the small part of the brain that controls coordination and motion and balance. Um, it's located at the very back part of the head, uh, what's called a posterior fossa. Uh, it's composed of two hemispheres, and the middle part uh, that's called vermis. And then underneath, along the undersurface of the two hemispheres, there's a, a, a pair of tonsils. Um, normally these tonsils and the entire cerebellum is located uh, inside the posterior fossa um, above the foramen magnum. Um, there's also very important fluid spaces uh, that are in that area. Uh, the one that we always talk about um, is uh, um, in, in conjunction to Chiari is the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna. Um, the cisterna magna, um, you can see in this uh, diagram, is uh, um, right along uh, at the bottom of the cerebellum um, where the tonsils sort of end. And that's how they're supposed to look. This is a normal brain. Um, the fourth ventricle um, is, um, is this a pointer, by the way? Um, I don't know if I have a pointer. Let me just bring the, if I can bring the uh, arrow here. So uh, this part here, this is the fourth ventricle, and this is cisterna magna. And here we have the cerebellum. It's a sagittal cut. Um, of the brain. So if you were to cut the head from here and look from the side, um, you, this, is, this is the view you get. And obviously, this is the uh, main part of the brain, um, including some of the um, uh, other fluid spaces. Um, so what is the Chiari malformation? There's uh, several different types. Um, the one we're going to be talking about the most and the one um, that's really the um, main mystery is the Chiari-1 malformation and its variants. So Chiari-1 
uh, malformation, and I'll show you pictures in just a bit, is when those cerebral tonsils um, herniate through the foramen magnum. What do the tonsils do? They don't really do anything. Um, so when we've treated the tonsils by making them shorter or you know, even sometimes taking them out, um, nothing really happens. But if the cerebral tonsils um, crowd the area um, where uh, they're not supposed to be, they can cause a lot of problems because there's a lot of important real estate there. Um, the brainstem, for example, is, is right in front of it. Um, and uh, um, if the fluid flow gets disturbed, uh, it can also have um, some serious effects. And we'll talk about those effects uh, in just a bit as well. So carry one um, is um, a herniation of those tonsils. Um, there's a um, sort of an arbitrary um, number that has been agreed upon on how much of herniation is needed to um, uh, constitute as, as KRE1. And that number um, that people came um, up with is um, 0 0.5 uh, centimeters, which is 5 millimeters or more. Um, KRE2 is uh, something that gets identified when you're a baby because there's a lot of other problems that um, go with it mo most of the time, almost always. Um, so these are babies that are born with spina bifida, myelomeningocele. Um, there's some obvious uh, de de developmental issues. And with KRE2, um, the effects are much more severe because the actual herniation is much more severe. The entire cerebral vermis um, travels down um, part of the brainstem, um, sits below the foramen magnum. And that, as you can imagine, causes a lot of problems. Um, sometimes these little babies, they have uh, very severe apneic episodes, it affects their breathing um, just because of the um, dysfunction um, that this kind of developmental anomaly causes to the brainstem. Um, Chiari 3 is a very severe form. Um, usually you see a, uh, either a high cervical um, uh, encephalocele, meningocele, um, or an occipital um, meningocele. And again, we'll, we'll look at some pictures and it'll be a little bit more clear. Chiari 4, uh, this is where the cerebellum doesn't develop at all. Um, and the whole posterior fossa is, is kind of a funnel shaped, not formed. And these babies don't usually make it through infancy. Um, so carry one. This is a uh, sort of a classic looking uh, picture of a carry one malformation with um, uh, a syrinx. So just to orient you here, uh, again, this is the cerebellum. These guys are not supposed to be here. This is supposed to be white, the CSF in this picture is white. The brain is gray. This is supposed to be brainstem spinal cord, and this white space is not supposed to be here. So this is the syrinx. And here, if we measure um, if this you know, patient um, uh, um, would be um, meeting the Chiari criteria, the original criteria, uh, this would have to be 0 0.5 uh, centimeters or more. But as you can see, uh, there's no space here. So the cisterna magna is missing. And certainly the flow of the CSF is not normal. Um, in Chiari 1's, the fourth ventricle sits where it's supposed to be. Um, but otherwise, this is, this is not a normal looking picture. Um, about, there's actually different reports on how many Chiari patients have syringomyelia, but some literature um, says around 25 quarter of the patients have an abnormally large um, uh, fluid space. Everybody has a tiny fluid space um, that's part of the CSF flow. Um, 
but uh, when when this expands into a large space like this, uh, that's that normally causes problems. The associated conditions that go with KRE1 um, are um, things like achondroplasia, um, congenital fusions of spine that are normal, like clipal flail, um, agromegaly, problems with growth hormone, um, either too much or too little. So there's something going on congenitally, congenitally um, that doesn't develop normally. Um, However, Chiaris um, can get worse over time or can, can form, so there's no one cause for a Chiari 1 malformation, which we'll talk about later, too, to try to figure out what causes Chiari. Chiari 2, this is a typical picture of a baby with a Chiari 2 malformation. And here you can see that the whole system travels down, so it's not just the tonsils that are below the foramen um, uh, uh, magnum, but also the fourth ventricle is lower than it's supposed to be. This is a picture of the um, uh, lower part of a uh, uh, spine of a baby that you can see that there's this protrusion here, um, a, a myelomeningus here. Um, so you see the problems um, uh, that occur. You've got the, the medulla kinks, which is the part of the brain stem. Um, there's also uh, beaking of this area here called the quadrigenimal plate. Um, a lot of the times, uh, very often, uh, KRE2s also have hydrocephalus. Um, so uh, most of the babies end up needing a shunt. Um, there is uh, an attempt to see if possibly um, the requirement for shunts and the severity of the Chiari 2 um, can be made better by trying to operate on these babies in utero. Um, there, there's a trial that's been ongoing for some time now called the MOMS trial, um, where actually the uterus is open and the baby's myelomeningocele is fixed before they are born. Uh, the data is still um, not quite complete, um, so the jury is out. Um, so, you know, basically, Chiari 2 is, you know, truly, you know, mostly a congenital condition where the spinal cord and the column doesn't close properly and it pulls everything down. Um, and uh, uh, they have a lot of problems since birth. They can have uh, depressed gag. They can uh, suffer from uh, aspiration problems um, as well as... Uh, central sleep apnea, which can be uh, very, very severe. Chiari uh, 3, which is uh, uh, the rarest, uh, less than 1% of the cases, uh, present with something like this. This is something that you see in utero and at birth. You'll have a big uh, herniation here uh, of all the contents of the cerebellum, sometimes brainstem, coming out of uh, these pouches. Uh, if this is treatable, if the baby's viable, uh, this has to be treated pretty promptly after birth. Um, and Chiari 4, obviously, this is the most severe where there's just a black hole here. So this is a different kind of an MRI where the CSF spaces look black. And here you see that there's really nothing here. And instead of a nice round posterior fossa, you just have this flat funnel-shaped um, structure here. And again, most of the babies with Chiari 4 uh, does not survive inf infancy. So I don't know if you noticed in the, in the uh, first part before we started talking about the different types of Chiari. Um, I said Chiari 1 malformation uh, types and then some. Well, there's other types that you've heard of, um, such as a Chiari 0, Chiari 1.5, so just to shed some light on what we're talking about when we refer to a Chiari 0. So Chiari 0 is just basically a, a small posterior uh, fossa, but there's no herniation below that would meet criteria of the cerebellar tonsils. But clearly you see there's something wrong here. Like uh, in this uh, picture over here, you see that there's 
really, really no fluid here. So there's no cisterna magna that can be seen. Um, and people made some attempts to measure the volumes of the posterior fossa, and these volumes um, measure lower than, smaller than average. So it's a smaller posterior fossa um, than what you would normally see. Um, oftentimes you also see a syrinx um, that's associated with this. So when they picked up by a radiologist, they don't necessarily keen into the, the fact that there's no cisterna magna, but they notice that there's a syrinx. And they get referred to a neurosurgeon, and if a neurosurgeon um, is familiar with this, they'll notice that, okay, that there's a problem here, and the big, biggest problem here is um, the lack of cisterna magna that's going to cause a problem with the circulation. So if these patients get decompressed, even though they don't have the tonsils, their syrinx usually gets better or goes away. Um, uh, one more Chiari, Chiari 1.5. So Chiari 1.5 uh, is actually thought to be an advanced form of Chiari, Chiari 1. So you have uh, not just the tonsillar herniation, but it's pretty severe tonsillar herniation causing this peaking of the tonsils, tonsillar ectopia, um, and, and uh, um, the old brain stem travels down. Um, a lot of the times when we go and we open up the posterior fossas, we'll find these tonsils being very ischemic looking, sort of different color than the rest of the cerebellum. Um, that they've been really kind of being compressed there for some time. Um, and again, um, Chiari 1, Chiari 1.5, and, and Chiari 0, they sometimes when we follow these patients for a long time, um, they get worse. You may start off with just being picked up um, uh, that you have a Chiari malformation because you bumped your head and you got an MRI or you have headaches and got an MRI and you are followed for a number of years and then your tonsil herniation gets worse. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of a new notion that they, this is not, not something that doesn't get worse and maybe sometimes it doesn't get better on its own. Um, then there's a new, sort of a newer concept called complex Chiari. So, uh, a lot of patients, they get, get a, a standard operation that most of the time works, but sometimes it only works for a little while, and sometimes uh, the, the patients after uh, some time get worse, and started looking at the reasons why. Um, so sometimes the patients with KRE1 malformation have associated conditions, uh, such as uh, connective tissue disorders, um, they may have um, um, other types of yet to be unidentified um, um, problems um, with um, bone. And uh, um, a lot of the times we've seen these very complex cases have uh, fused segments of uh, the cervical vertebra. Uh, the first uh, ring that's supposed to be independent is actually fused to the occiput, um, or there are two segments that are fused together, and these can cause problems. So over here you see that um, there's not just a problem on the back here, but there's a problem on the front. So this dense seems to be digging into the brainstem, and there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to be talking more about this uh, this weekend, so I'm just going to touch upon it. Um, but we'll have to be aware that there's a small subgroup of patients that fall into this category of complex Chiari and they need special attention because standard treatments may not um, work for them and they may, may need uh, uh, something additional to be done. Um, and it, there's, there's also two groups of these complex carries. There's the uh, de novo patients that we are able to pick up and recognize that these are patients who might develop problems later on. And then there are pa patients who've had standard treatments and they've failed their treatments. So these are the de novo versus post-surgery um, Chiari patients. 
Um, and these patients have a high risk of developing craniocervical instability. Uh, they present a little bit differently too. They may have um, symptoms that um, point to problems with the brain stem, such as problems swallowing. Uh, they may have uh, intractable hiccups. Uh, they may have sleep apnea. Um, so uh, we oftentimes refer these patients to some more testing um, before we do anything, uh, including looking at the craniocervical function a little bit more carefully, getting some flexion extension films, um, um, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, um, something, again, that uh, um, you'll hear more about this weekend from other speakers. So what about prevalence of Chiari? Chiari is a pretty rare disorder. Um, but once you have it, it doesn't really matter because uh, it affects you and it affects your whole family and your whole life. Um, so it's estimated to be uh, less than 1%, um, although there's a, uh, a report that was published in 2001 looking at uh, children. I think there's a large number of MRIs that were get gotten for one reason or, or another that uh, recognized um, um, pediatric patients um, of having about 3.6% prevalence. About 14% of these patients were uh, not symptomatic um, after a long, long follow-up. But um, uh, a great number of them actually developed symptoms or were symptomatic. Um, sometimes it's said that this affects more women, but there's also data that says there's no real uh, sex predilection um, or ethnic or geographic distribution. Obviously, we know and people here in this room know that uh, tend to run on families, so there has to be some kind of a genetic link. Um, and uh, uh, we've seen multiple family members that, you know, mom, all the kids um, have a Chiari malformation, so there has to be something there. And there's actually a speaker this week who will we'll address this, see where they where they at in uh, terms of trying to identify the Chiari gene. So what are the uh, um, factors that go into diagnosing somebody with Chiari? Again, if you bump your head and they say, okay, you have a Chiari malformation, you get a frantic call from your primary care doctor saying, oh, you need surgery. Well, that's really not the case. If you don't have any symptoms, if you've never had you know, any, any kind of issues, um, and you have this, it doesn't mean that you need anything done. But if you have the um, corresponding symptoms that go with the imaging, um, you, you are likely to have um, a symptomatic Chiari. So what are the clinical symptoms that uh, are common with Chiari? Uh, there's a really wide variety of symptoms, so it's a little bit difficult or, or to diagnose a Chiari. Um, people present with different um, uh, kinds of things, but the uh, most common uh, things that we see is uh, occipital headaches. A lot of the times the headaches get worse when um, you cough, when you go to the bathroom, when you laugh, when you sneeze. Uh, anything that raises the pressure in the brain. It's called a Valsalva maneuver. Um, sometimes we have balance problems. Um, we have uh, dizziness that doesn't really resolve. Uh, when we test your eye movements, and nystagmus is also commonly seen. And a lot of the kids are picked up with uh, um, scoliosis that just keeps getting worse. And when they get imaged, they found to have um, uh, a syrinx and, and um, a Chiari. So that's, that's another uh, interesting thing. And usually the progression of the scoliosis stops um, once this is treated. Um, diagnostic studies, uh, the gold standard uh, of a diagnostic study is an MRI. Uh, we always want the sagittal T2s to see the CSF spaces and uh, to see uh, uh, where the tonsils end up uh, below the, um, the foramen magnum. Sometimes if you suspect that we're dealing with a more complex issue, uh, CAT scan can be also helpful to look at the bone to see if there's any fused segments. Um, Sometimes we also get imaging of the vessels to see where the vertebral arteries run, because they sort of run very close to where we do surgery, and they're they important. 
Um, the other studies that we may order are CSF flow studies to see how the how they, um, uh, CSF circulates, if there's any circulation on the cisterna magna, if anything is sort of borderline. Uh, sleep studies may be helpful to see if there's any effect on the brainstem, if there's any um, uh, damage or, or, or problem. Um, then uh, a little bit more uh, complex studies are uh, bears and SSEPs who look like uh, uh, the, the tracks of the your sensory and, and uh, sort of give an idea on how the brain stem is working. Um, there, again, is a general agreement uh, with the neurologi uh, um, um, neuroradiologists and just general radiologists across the country and across the world on what's a Chiari, that's a herniation of the tonsils uh, um, below the foramen magnum of uh, 0.5 centimeters or more, but the neuroradiologists are not always um, honed into looking at other things like the size of the cisterna magna and uh, uh, the angulation of your, um, your, your clival axial angle, which uh, we'll touch on and other people will talk about. Uh, so that's sort of a good pickup for uh, radiologists to say, hey, this might be a Chiari, and then um, we need uh, um, people that are used to dealing with this to evaluate a little bit further. So what's cisterna magna for? Why do we need cisterna magna? Why do I keep talking about cisterna magna? So cisterna magna is a buffer um, uh, that buffers the, the brain and the spinal cord from comp compression um, at the time when we move our neck. And it also allows for circulation of the CSF normally. Um, you know, if there's any blockage in any of these pathways, uh, if there's a blockage um, on the other areas of the uh, um, CSF spaces, we see hydrocephalus. That's sort of an easy pickup. But um, the circulation um, to the, around the spinal cords goes both ways. It goes anteriorly and posteriorly and through the fourth ventricle. If there's still some circulation uh, left, you don't necessarily see a problem as fast as you would if you have a blockage let's say on the third ventricles and your, your lateral ventricles blow up and you have fluoride hydrocephalus. Um, causes of Chiari malformation, again, there's not, no one identifiable cause. Um, and it's not just a fixed uh, dysphraphic lesion, but maybe dynamic uh, entity that changes over time. Uh, potential culprits that we've identified is a small or malformed posterior fossa. Um, often associated with craniofacial syndro uh, syndromes um, and genetic link tends to run in families. Um, also, you know, um, um, intracranial hypotension, uh, which is, so, that's a pretty easy thing to pick up on Chiari 2 is that is intracranial hypotension, there's something open in the spine that just pulls everything down. Um, but th that, might be, that might be one of the reasons that a secondary Chiari or Chiari may develop later on is that there's a leak or, or something going on that's pulling everything down. Um, hyper, intracranial hypertension too, like pseudotremor, cerebri, um, something that's pushing things down. So once a Chiari is identified, what do we do about it? Um, initially, try medical management, we try to treat the pain. If you just have headaches, um, you know, treating the headache, but if uh, things progress and uh, um, the symptoms don't go away or become worse, um, the um, time is to think about uh, treatment. Um, the mainstay uh, treatment, uh, there's really no non-surgical treatments other than uh, managing the symptoms available. Um, so the mainstay surgical treatment is a suboxable uh, craniectomy uh, with, with or without opening uh, the dura. Uh, I think in this room, most of us open the dura um, and uh, uh, expand the, uh, expand the uh, um, um, cisterna magna unless there's a very clear reason why um, um, there's, there's abnormal bony compression that can be clearly relieved 
with just the bony decompression. And a lot of the times we can test this by putting an ultrasound into the space and seeing if the flow uh, uh, gets better. So main goal in the surgery is to recreate the cisterna magna and restore normal CSF flow. Um, in addition to taking part of the um, cranium at the back of the head off, uh, we also take the ring of the very first uh, vertebra, the C1 vertebra. Uh, to allow it more space. The C1 uh, ring is sort of ornamental and it doesn't offer that much support to the, um, uh, to the uh, 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 craniocervical junction. Um, obviously, if we do have a connective tissue disorder, we may find out later on that this is, this is, uh, this, this is not making things any better and the patient may require fusion. Um, but most of the time this works um, we also have different techniques to treat the tonsils. Some of us um, don't touch the tonsils um, unless they are extremely long and come way below um, the, the C1 vertebra. Um, uh, many um, neurosurgeons um, um, do what's called coagulation of the tonsils. They apply a little bit of heat and the tonsils sort of shrink up and uh, um, there are also um, neurosurgeons who uh, cut the tonsils. Uh, so they you know, basically amputate the tonsils. So again, there's many ways to skin a cat. Uh, as long as we recreate the cyst in the magna, um, we achieve the same um, um, end result. Uh, dural patch, different materials that we can use for uh, patching of the dura. There's um, uh, pericranium that comes from the patient. There's also artificial materials that work just as well. Uh, this is a picture, um, a 3D reconstruction of a CAT scan that shows um, um, basically the missing parts. This is what has been taken out. Normal comes to here. This is a, uh, um, a craniectomy. And the normal ring runs here, and that's also taken out. Uh, a cartoon version. Here you can see the C1 arch being cut and um, uh, the craniectomy allowing us to see uh, the cerebellar tonsils here, cerebellum, cerebellum, and the door is opened and held open. There's an actual picture um, of cerebellum. <laughs> Sorry, eating your breakfast. Um, but here you can see the opening of the dura. And uh, um, uh, the craniectum. And close your eyes. There's some more uh, anatomy pictures coming up if uh, you get squeamish. Here you can see that the tonsils have been buzzed a little bit. They've been uh, coagulated. So this you know, opens up the fourth ventricle. We always, in search of the fourth ventricle, we want to see nice flow out of the fourth ventricle before we're satisfied. Um, the end result looks something like this. Um, this is a dural patch that's been applied and sewn into um, the original dura to give it a little bit more room. And hopefully this will play in a little video here. Well, unfortunately, the video doesn't play. I suspected this. But the video is of the same picture, and it shows pulsations, which is kind of neat, because that's what you want to see. You want to see pulsations. And you can, again, if you don't really see that, you can apply an ultrasound and just um, confirm that. So um, some people do this through smaller openings. Some people do this through bigger openings. Um, Dr. Riquet uses a, um, a plate that uh, allows the dura to be tacked up to you know, really give it a good pouch um, back there. And here you can see the, this metal plate. If you leave this open, it doesn't usually, it doesn't cause you know, any um, danger to you unless you get hit with a nail right <laughs> below your, um, um, your occiput because there's a lot of muscle and a lot of tissue 
that you have to get through to before you get to this. So there's about this much meat before you see, well, if you're a bigger person this much, if you're a little person, you know, always a little bit less. But there's no, um, I think that's a pretty common question of what happens if, you know, you don't put the bone back, uh, nothing. So, uh, and what do we want to see after the surgery? Something like this. So this is pre-surgery. You see these tonsils are crowding the cisterna magna. And here you see a new beautiful white space. So this is a, uh, a, a successful um, uh, decompression. Well, here you actually see some other things too. You see how there's a problem here. There's a lot of compression from the front. And uh, now the compression's off. So this person is actually, uh, in addition to getting their tonsils hacked off, also got um, uh, a, a fusion. Um, so this leads us to um, talk about complex Chiari again. Um, this is, this is a, a problem that we at times see patients have had a decompression. Um, they get better first, and then they start getting worse. And they start developing these um, uh, symptoms that uh, indicate that there's a problem uh, with the brain stem. And here you see, again, you see this finger sticking into the brain stem. So this is not healthy. After a while, um, this may not be reversible. So uh, we have to really um, be uh, on a lookout if you get progressive symptoms that are not getting better. Uh, there might not be a problem in the back anymore. Now the problem's in the front. Um, we took out something that on normal people is ornamental, like the C1 ring and a little bit of cerebellum. But um, in a person with connective tissue problems or um, other problems that make them at risk for craniocervical instability, um, it, it, it doesn't help. So um, again, you know, the pathology of the craniocervical instability, um, the, the whole joint's very complex. There's a lot of different biomechanics that go in uh, to it. There's um, instability that can be of different types, horizontal, vertical, uh, rotational. We do a lot of testing when we identify somebody with this kind of disorder. We do uh, flexion ex extension MRIs. Um, x-rays, um, and uh, uh, we, we really look at the symptomology, may send, send, send you to a sleep study to see if there's any um, uh, problems with sleep apnea, uh, swallow studies, etc. cetera. Uh, symptoms with complex Chiari, um, again, diplopia, vertigo, um, apnea, uh, myelopathy, things get really bad, you start getting spastic, having difficulty walking, um, ataxia, which is sort of gait and balance. Um, a person treated with this, this is a, uh, a, a typical treatment for craniocervical instability. Um, you will get a fusion uh, from the occiput to uh, C1, C2. Um, I, I know Dr. Bolognese um, has done his most recent fusions to the, the condyles, which are these guys over here. Uh, a lot of these have been reduced, and there has ne not necessarily been enough bone to put the plates um, to the, the occiput like this. Um, and Dr. Regate here um, um, uh, wrote um, a lot of papers about um, intraoperatively reducing uh, the um, uh, compression to the, the brainstem initially Years ago, uh, these were treated anteriorly. You get a very um, sort of a not so commonly done procedure anymore um, uh, uh, called a um, odontoidectomy. Uh, that was done from the front, and then you would need another surgery from the back. So um, uh, this is Dr. Riquet's technique where you can actually take the, comp the anterior compression off by disconnecting everything and then intraoperatively reducing um, the compression of the brainstem. And this is all done with uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy and ultrasound to confirm um, the result. Where you can see the dense here is this little blob is off the brainstem. Uh, again, there's going to be people who talk about this more this weekend. So 
enough about that. I think I'm grossly out of time. Um, so in conclusion, there's no single um, theory of pathogenesis to explain all the issues with the Chiari. Um, it's essential to look for the cause of the Chiari uh, as the management of the disorder uh, differ. And uh, a long-term um, perspective studies are needed to make any conclusions um, on treatments and uh, treatment techniques and natural history of this disease. And lastly, I just uh, put a few pictures here of my, my very favorite mentors. And uh, I want to thank everybody. So the question is, um, um, she was born with a uh, uh, small Chiari, no symptoms until she was 45 when she was hit in the back of the head and then became symptomatic with headaches. And uh, why is that? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know um, without seeing any imaging and knowing more about your history. But um, again, being hit in the head, um, I mean, it may be a post-concussive sy uh, syndrome versus uh, problems with the, the circulation, as you had mentioned. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really know. <laughs> Probably the pressure. A lot of the times, uh, uh, the headaches are, uh, are sort of described as as pressure, sort of very localized. So, you're welcome. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Um, so, for children who have the craniocervical fusion, what? What is the future like? Is there difficulty with hardware? Is there revisions that need to be done? Like, is there chances of future surgeries? Um, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that later. There's a big topic about yeah. just about that, so maybe you wouldn't mind waiting for that. No, yeah, it's a great discussion. It's a really important point. Okay. Yeah, maybe one more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. you had mentioned that there's a, a measurement for PRA1. Is yes. there a measurement that doctors consider for PRA1? Yeah, I think most of us um, would more likely be to, to cauterize if there's um, um, a longer um, Chiari tonsils. Um, I, I think there's different techniques, um, but the main purpose of the surgery is recreating that cisterna magna. Um, and some of us will maybe allow a little bit more tonsils there if there's a good um, pouch that uh, creates the, recreates the flow. Um, and, and as for Chiari 1.5, uh, it's, it's Chiari 1 and then some. So there's more uh, brainstem um, below the uh, foramen magnum and the fourth ventricle is lower. Uh, but I don't, I don't think there's any strict criteria. It's just that it, it's not just the tonsils, there's also other issues. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay.